Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with Spending Time, the Blog to Watch podcast. I am joined by David Breden. Hey David. Hey everyone. So today we're going to talk about watch case materials and maybe a little bit of ranting. Um, Yay, ranting. I think we need to make the shows a little bit more focused sometimes because I, I find that people like to listen to a show for a specific purpose. Like, oh, they're going to talk about this topic. Um, last time we responded to some of the... Uh, called the audience members common sentiments and all of a sudden David got bored and started looking at show hard watches that's exactly what happened yeah yeah that's not my phone by no, the way that that's was your phone. my phone I'm a very popular person um <laughs> <laughs> because your phone is ringing yeah. that, that that makes for a clear yeah, connection yeah <laughs> look if uh, here's the thing if your phone rings it doesn't necessarily mean you're popular but if your phone doesn't ring it definitely means you're not popular quack, quack. right Case materials, right? Yes. Okay, so case materials. So I am at the tail end of a review of what's called the Ublo Big Bang Unico Magic Sapphire. Um, the magic thing about it is it's super legible. <laughs> well, well, what they did is they they took a sa- one of their sapphire cased watches and they put a normal dial on it, so it's not the clear dial. And I remember when Ublo first came out with their sapphire crystal watch, they went ahead and they they, I don't remember how to explain it. It wasn't a completely transparent dial. You want to pull this up on the site? The the, the first yeah. Sapphire one? I remember the thing that really mm-hmm. kind of was weird to me is they used this, I think it was like a, a, a silicon um, strap that was kind of like a semi-clear material. I just, I, I wasn't into it. The strap was kind of bothered me. And then on the dial, there was, it was, they tried to make it transparent. Like it was as transparent as could possibly. So there's the magic one. And here it is. There's, there we go. So that's the original one. That's the non-magic one. That's the first Sapphire one. And it was cool because it was like a proof of concept, right? So yeah. they obviously did their job in rendering a design that said, like, hey, we can do Sapphire now. And that was cool. But it's not very practical as a daily wear. Then came the magic Sapphire one, which is legible. But the point that I want to talk about is Sapphire Crystal as a case material. And I want to sort of rebut the most common thing that we hear is, oh, it looks like plastic. Um, okay, I guess it's true that from afar and in pictures, you could make an argument that this case could theoretically be mistaken for like an acrylic or some type of a a plastic material. When you touch it, when you feel it, and when you see how it wears, it immediately becomes obvious it's not plastic. Plastic scratches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while it is technically possible to scratch sapphire, it's a lot harder than scratching plastic. You have to try very hard. Yeah. Yeah, you have to try very hard. Um, The second sort of rebuttal is that this thing could shatter. Mm-hmm. Right. If you if you drop this thing the wrong way, it could break. And with a metal case, that would never happen. No, it's metal bends. Yeah. Um, but the same issue existed for ceramic watches. Where everyone's like, "Oh, if it, if it, if it, you know, it drops, it breaks." I, I've dropped ceramic watches. I've seen them drop. They haven't. They haven't all broken. That's just not the way it works. Not all of them, or none of them. I've never seen one break. I've never okay. actually heard it. Well, okay. I heard one. I remember one person told me that they 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 hit a ceramic watch very hard against a wall and one of the lugs broke so they hit it just at the lug Mm -hmm. and and of course with a big bang it has a different lug structure so i don't actually know that it would be an issue in a watch like this but they actually broke a lug and they got it fixed and it probably wasn't the cheapest thing in the world but they admit it was their fault they did something stupid yeah but funny but i i I know someone who's uh who's broken off a lug of a patek philippe with a door handle actually because i see was reaching for it like this was like the door of a restaurant and it had two of these metal bars and as you were reaching for one of them and as you would twist your wrist to open it or something like that to pull it the watch would just bang against or or just somehow get pushed against the other handle and that's how basically one of the locks fell off and once you want to replace a wide bolt case or any you know for that matter a stainless steel case from a big brand it's going to cost basically just as much as it would from from ceramic, I think. As far as you know, luxury brands like top end uh, brands are concerned. Maybe not in an IWC if you have a four thousand dollar IWC and you break one of the locks. Of course, you know the case is going to be less expensive than on a ten thousand dollar ceramic case one. So I will give you that. But what most people seem to forget is that not only ceramic watches can break, but uh, you know I've seen uh, precious metal watch cases break all the same. You know, usually locks actually. Look, I think everyone's just concerned. It's a new material, and they want 
they want reasons to to want less, to buy less. Mm-hmm. I, I think we've seen this a lot, and and it's an interesting sort of form of consumer behavior, where there's this rejection of cool new things because it's cool and new because you're worried, oh my God, now I have to buy something new. There's so many exciting luxury items to buy, not just watches, but so many exciting luxury items to buy yeah. that when we see something new, it's like we want to find a reason to dismiss it. Yeah. Because very few people can afford all this stuff. But we're talking right now to the people that are going to wait a couple of years and then they can decide. Ceramic was the same way. When ceramic watches first became popular, it's obviously right Rado was... Well, Rado didn't really make them popular, at least not in the U.S. Yeah. Chanel made it popular in the U.S. And I remember the same thing. Ceramic can break. Ceramic can break. And then all of a sudden, everyone jumps on ceramic. I think Sapphire is going to be similar. Sapphire is, my understanding, a lot more difficult to machine than ceramic, though ceramic definitely has its challenges. Um, but I think that I think that Sapphire Crystal has a lot more value than I think people are giving it right now for the future of fashionability and luxury watches. I, you know, I've been the sort of big fan of, of what I call non-metal. Yeah. Right. This transition away from using traditional metal parts to non-metallic parts. I yeah. think that this is the future, not just of case material, but of watch movement material. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's only a matter of time before you have a movement which is which is made entirely from non-metal materials with with sapphire crystal and ceramic and of course silicon that that's doable now and if it's not doable now we're really 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 close it's yeah. only a matter of time before someone says like hey let's make an entire mechanical movement that has no metal i've seen it done out of wood yeah yeah i'm trying to think what else you know there 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 are rumors rumors about silicon movements or silicium movements you know with uh, Reels and and whatnot crafted from that material. Well, that's that I think actually is closer than we would think. But as for other materials, you know what else is there? There's carbon fiber, some weird sort of composite. You have sapphire, you have ceramic. But I'm, you know the problem usually is actually when it comes to working with other materials uh, than uh, metal, is drilling these extremely fine and extremely small holes into them. So for example, here if you look at this picture. Just, just as an example, you see a tiny little jewel here, and I, I know because you know, they told me in all these manufacturers that I've been to that uh, these holes for the uh, for the jewels have to be cut with a precision of less than five microns. So that's the tolerance with which you know uh, you know the the accuracy has to be done when threading these holes. And s- some materials you simply cannot cut these extremely fine holes into because they will just shatter or the tools will break or something else will happen. Or maybe you can do it once, but you cannot do it at a rate of thousands upon thousands of pieces of different shapes and different holes and different different uh, tools and all that kind of stuff. Well, I, 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 look, I heard someone tell me, I think they said 30%. Mm. That's of the sapphire components produce break. So while they are being machined, 30% of them just break. At, at some stage or another. And that's a tricky bit because let's let's imagine like you're drilling these holes, there are six screws in this bezel of this hublot and it shatters when you're drilling the sixth. That's, that means that the last couple of hours that you spend drilling these and just trying to get to the rough shape of this bezel is all just down the drain because you cannot salvage this part in any uh, that's, way, that's shape or That's true. Form. That's true, but so, uh, so this is what I think about it. That's one of the reasons this is so expensive. And as we know, mm-hmm. even when it's machined normally, because it's so it's so hard, the tools wear out really quick. So the tool heads of the cutting machines need to be replaced, like constantly. Like they would last a lot longer with metal. The softer th- the softer the material, obviously, the longer the tools last. Yeah. So the tooling needs to be replaced a lot, and there's a high sh- you know there's a high failure rate, at least compared to metal, right? Like metal is not just going to spontaneously like crack when you're using it. Like, I'm sure other things can happen. There's a failure rate, but it's not as high as sapphire. The good news is that this material is not inherently precious. Mm-hmm. Sapphire is grown. Mm-hmm. Getting large quantities of synthetic sapphire is not particularly challenging or expensive. I want, so, yeah. Go ahead. If, there, if there's a facility set up to do this, then theoretically speaking, it shouldn't be that difficult to get enough of these. It's never going to be as mass produced as metal. But I mean, remember the first time a Sapphire watch came out? It was the Richard Mille. It was over a million bucks. And everyone was like, ooh. exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, and the story was there. I remember because I wrote an article about it and I watched a bunch of interviews with uh, 
with Richard Mille himself, and he said, you know, well, it takes like some ridiculous number of hours, like a thousand hours or something like that, to create one of those cases. And of course, it was uh, Richard Mille, so it was total overkill in every you know in every way that you can imagine in terms of shape and the complexity of the of the different pieces and stuff like that. But still, you know, one point four million, and we are now down to under fifty thousand, around fifty thousand for one of these big be bangs. And I'm willing to bet we will see yet more affordable, relatively speaking. Uh, I think so. Fire. How how low do you think it'll go in the next five years for a sapphire crystal case? What's your guess? I think it will sooner or later not be more expensive than they not have more of a premium than thirty or forty percent over any given brand's ceramic offerings. So, if, for example, IWC has a twelve thousand dollar IWC pilot in ceramic, then they will have one in sapphire for. 17 or 18 grand that, that's what i'm thinking okay do you th- we just saw recently for example Audemar Piguet coming out with a ceramic version of the royal oak remember the the ceramic perpetual calendar yeah that was that was pricey uh i wasn't it was you know it was i forget exactly what it was it was expensive watch for sure um and it was interesting to see a brand that is typically thought of as being very conservative, very resistant to trying new things. I mean, I think the the most wild things that, that Audemars Piguet has been doing lately is colors. Yeah, um, exactly. I know that they sort of made headlines years ago when they started using forged carbon mm-hmm. uh, that they charged a that huge amount cool. of money for. Yeah. It was cool, but I think what was interesting is they started doing it. That I remember they were producing in-house, and then a bunch of other people started coming out with it for like... A fraction. Two thousand bucks, yeah, two thousand bucks, and not like you know twenty five thousand, thirty thousand bucks, and all of a sudden the Audemars Piguet one doesn't feel as special anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hold on, let, let me show you this. I, I want to show you this. I'm not sure if it was this watch, but I just stumbled up on one of these Porsche carbon APs here on Gothberg, and I was looking at the pictures. Maybe it was on this watch, but look at this case. It's extremely rough. So the, of course we are now drifting away from Sapphire, but. This is actually a good discussion because this highlights the fact uh, that how accurately you can you can work with Sapphire. If you look at this, I was looking at one of these macros of this watch, of this transparent Sapphire Hublot, and you could really see the super crisp logs and the case profile and all that. And you could really think, you could really appreciate the accuracy with which this material can be worked with. If you know where the, what you're doing here, this is the picture right here. So you're seeing a bunch of different angles and and curved. Uh, edges and all this kind of stuff and then by stark contrast you look at this forged carbon case in this AP and it looks like a black watch that melted or that was <laughs> built by a child but using like some gum or something it not a sharp edge on it anywhere so okay this, so let me let me like let me just say a few things so I'm holding the sapphire case in my head right now and speaking of sharp edges, I actually have to say that they did a very nice job not making this watch sharp it is yeah, cut yeah, yeah. very very well it's also feels little it feels lighter mm-hmm. than than metal and i i don't know exactly how uh, crystal weighs in comparison to metal but i've always thought of crystal as being dense so i always thought it would be a uh, heavier actually than metal but it seems I don't either think about so. the same. yeah yeah well, it's, it seems like it's it could be a little bit lighter yeah yeah it's about yeah it's difficult to tell because once you have like a an automatic uh, chronograph movement with a bunch of uh, extra functions and stuff like that that also offsets the weight pretty much. And a couple of millimeters here and there. I would say it's right around the same as a stainless steel case. Maybe I, I'm wrong. I don't know. But uh, I would say it's roughly the same. No, you're not wrong. I mean, I, I think the whole point of this conversation is to discuss alternatives to metal. Steel is probably the best all-around case material right now when it comes to cost. And it's funny. When did stainless steel actually start becoming popular? Because we take for granted now that the watches we like are stainless steel. But there was a time where they're, they're, they weren't stainless steel. In fact, um, you know, gold, for example, was was used in certain instances because it, 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 didn't, it didn't corrode. It didn't stain. Yeah. Um, well, it, sometimes it does... Uh, develop some stains, especially white gold. If you don't like, then uh, add some proper uh, uh, surface treatment to it, or you don't gotta have, polish your gold, huh? Uh, it will look ugly as crap, you know. But uh, actually, to answer your question, of course, it was the Royal Oak in '72 that was the first that prides itself today as being the first luxury watch that came in all stainless steel and cost actually more than some of the gold offerings of AP at the time. So that broke down this barrier. Was it? I didn't. I don't. Rem- I don't remember that. I know. I remember. Obviously, it was. A f- it was the most expensive steel watch at the time. But was it? 
Was that part of the spiel that it was stainless steel? I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just don't remember that. Well, it depends what, we were, what you're talking about. If you're talking about top-end luxury prized watches, then it was the first. But obviously, you know, for example, Rolex with all the dive watches and all, all the previous tool watches that we remember, we remember from the 50s and 60s came in steel and a bunch of other watches long before that also came in steel. But steel also obviously became higher and higher grade and higher quality. Yeah, so you can machine steel really, really well, especially the grades of steel they're used in watches. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of set a bar aesthetically. You can you can machine gold in a similar way. It's softer, of course, and doesn't hold it as well. But I think, you know, the, the reason that alternatives to metal have become popular, one is fashion. You have a different look. But two, there's yeah. actual significant benefits and, and, and upgrades. I think the most popular one that has been, you know, completely adopted is titanium. Titanium yep. watches Finally. are not new. Um, but were expensive for a long time, and then actually got inexpensive. You had like Citizen and stuff like that, and you could buy like a three hundred dollar titanium watch. But it wasn't until the you know m a little bit more recently. We're obviously talking more than ten years ago that titanium entered the world of the high end luxury watch, and you started having the same type of machining on titanium with and higher finishing. grade titanium yeah. and finishing than you have with steel. Yeah, and titanium was. It, scr it scratches easily. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, most of them. I mean, there are some hardened titaniums here and there. What I want to do, and shame on me, I haven't done that, but I want to give a try to uh, Grand Seiko's or Seiko's, you know, super hard titanium or something like that, because I do genuinely want to see, um, you know, how long those last in terms of wear and tear and all that kind of stuff. Because I do have a Grand Seiko in steel and it looks like crap. You know, for other people, I for me it's patina. I don't really, I don't care because it's a daily wear watch. But in eighteen months, it has so many scratches and you know so many of its surfaces. I sort of want to know how well a, a material would perform that's actually rated or advertised as being two or two and a half times harder. Um, you know, there's a there's a man in in rural Japan right now who makes watches who. He's probably crying right now hearing that. Well, uh, well, you know, <laughs> someone at someone at Seiko in the mountains <laughs> where Grand Seiko is assembled is is currently yes. shedding a tear, thinking about the fact that there's a scratched up Grand Seiko out there. If it makes him feel any better, I think of him often as well. Whoever applied the Zerzi finishing on my Grand Seiko, I beg for his forgiveness every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, we we've, we've all had this experience of getting a, 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 a watch in steel it starts to scratch and some people love it but some people have a real issue with it and I really think that these alternative materials pose um, a lot of value to people that want their products to stay new and the funny thing with these vintage watches everyone's like oh it's got patina it looks worn but no one seems to want to have their own watch be worn it's like they want to inherit a watch which is already all scratch up like oh it's okay it's vintage <laughs> but like a lot of people don't want it on their own now, some people do, but I think that there is probably consensus that most people want their watches to look new. So, titanium is light, and I think that it's sort of ushered in the area of l luxury as lightness, whereas opposed to the older sort of mentality that the heavier a watch was, the better it was, because it was, you know, more solid. Gold obviously weighs more than steel. And then titanium brought in this new era of lightness that, again, Richard Meal has really taken to the extreme. Titanium is lighter than steel, which is why it was is valued. The, the, the increased strength for watch purposes doesn't matter at all as far as I'm concerned. And then ceramic was the one that everyone didn't know what to make of. Because, again, they were so obsessed with this notion they could it could break. And it, I guess it can. But ceramic? To me... The scratch resistance, the fact that it looks, it will look new for a long time, outweighs outweighs the potential of it breaking on, on shock. What about for you? That's extremely attractive. Yeah, I just wrote that in my in my previous review of the Blue Big Bang or Linsky that comes in uh, in ceramic, and I and I was thinking to myself, yeah, you know, whoever says that they are not bothered by the scratches on their watches, I believe is lying, or they don't really know what what you're talking about. If you have fifty scratches on your watch. There might be one that's like from a good memory or a fun memory or something cool happened or whatever. <laughs> but the 49 other ones are just, you know, an abom uh, abomination. You, you look at it and you're like, well, I remember when it was shiny and it was right and when it was just, you know, original. And now it's all scratched up. That's not right. And now you can work with ceramic and some other materials 
to such a level that you have so sharp edges and, uh, and beautiful, you know, angles and surfaces and stuff like that, that you are really not missing out on anything. For that matter, you know, for example, I see titanium all the time. It's really not that sharp in, in comparison to what they can do with ceramic these days. That's that's true. So I think ceramic is here to stay. Yeah. Sapphire might be something that comes in and and takes over. Not replaces it, but it adds a new dimension. I mean, having a clear watch mm -hmm. is something that doesn't sound cool like unless you look at it and wear it like, "Oh, wait a minute, that is kind of awesome." Like I you never thought you wanted a clear watch until you wore a clear watch. Right. Um have you worn a clear watch before, like a totally transparent watch? Only briefly, not not to not for long. That's that's why I'm envious that you have that in for review. Um, I I sort of want to know what it's like, especially considering the fact that you can't really see your wrist hair with it. That's what I found. So it's not like a, a skeletonized watch where you can you know you have this massive area with your like <laughs> you know arm hair uh, pushed against your wrist you know just looking back at you you know like a fish in an aquarium or something like that it's it's a set site but with a, with a with a case like this because of all these angles and distortions in it you get this sensation of it being transparent but you actually can't really see your wrist so you're looking at the watch and not whatever is behind it you could, with synthetic sapphire, produce it in a bunch of different colors. And Hublot has done that, and, I'm, and yes. we're going to see more of it. There's going to be entirely black ones. There's smoky black ones, which are sort of translucent. There are They make a blue one. They make a red one. Um, I think there's a lot of potential here. I'm actually looking forward to seeing colors that you have not been able to achieve in ceramics. So, for example, imagine a light pink sapphire crystal case. You can't you can't do that with ceramic. It looks yeah. terrible. Uh, yeah, right now you can't. Ye but... Yellow, for example, or any of these light colors. There's a there's a fashionability that you can achieve with this material. So there's I think there's a marketable purpose behind it. You mm -hmm. know, it's not just like nerds liking it. You know, I think one of the things of having a tra a, a totally transparent watch like this is the novelty value. If everyone has a transparent watch, I'm not sure how well it'll hold up as being a prestigious item. Meaning, I still, I think that people are willing to spend. So this one, you know, this Hublot is about 60,000 bucks, which is a lot. You know, it, yeah. it's, it, it's almost $40,000 more than a similar watch that doesn't have a sapphire crystal case, right? Same movement, same dimensions, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's a hefty premium. Yeah. And if only some people are able to have it, that'll happen. I think that people are going to want this case material, but it's not going to be something that people will forever pay this high amount for. Similar to Audemars Piguet and this notion of forged carbon. So let's talk about carbon. Yeah. Carbon fiber, uh, forged carbon, uh, various different types of carbon. This is, interestingly for me, one of the most popular case materials now because it's so freaking cheap to make. You can have a carbon case to watch for a hundred bucks. Mm, and really? it's not that expensive. Oh yeah, carbon. Look, down to hundred. Just... I knew I I had a few watches that were like six or seven hundred or five hundred, but the one hundred dollars really. They're not fancy watches. I know, uh, but Lumin still. Luminox, for example, I don't know the lowest prices they have there, but you have. They've been using various types of uh, carbon cases for a long time. Now they have some new That's ones. That's true. It's like you two know. or three hundred bucks. Yeah, you were right. Uh, you know, Breitling came in with their you know two thousand dollar that was supposed to be like oh my god two thousand buck I think it was two thousand yeah. yeah the Colt that I think they're about to stop making anyways mm -hmm. um, the Sky Racer you should anyone who, who likes that watch should pick one up really soon because those are when they are discontinued they will sell like pretty high yeah those are those are really great watches I think those were very nicely done that was a that was a you know with their quartz movements yeah so Cost really, really quartz. light high end quartz. Mm -hmm. Super the carbon is lightweight. Yeah. Does it do, car, will carbon scratch? Sure. Is it easier to see when it scratches? No. Um, you and I have both worn carbon. I won't spend yeah. Audemars Piguet money on carbon, but I I don't mind it. Yeah, I don't mind. Yeah, there. Two, yeah, okay, so uh, let's first discuss the many different types of carbon fiber because some types of carbon you can actually get for a couple hundred bucks. That's correct. But some other types of carbon. Um, which are not these molded, um, ra rather cheap composites, but uh, these layered carbons, they, they are much more expensive and much more labor-intensive to make. So those will not be ever 
available for a couple hundred bucks. So I'm looking at a Victorinox right now that costs 850 bucks. And it's this, this grainy, dark gray kind of color that doesn't really have much texture to it. So it's not forced carbon. I believe this is actually carbon reinforced polymer. So it's a CF, RPL, or something like that, carbon fiber reinforced polymer, which is actually plastic with some carbon in it. And this allows brands to call it carbon when it actually is kind of is. They can ride the waves of carbon, and people will look at it and say, oh, is it a carbon watch? Is it only a couple hundred bucks? Then I would go for it. And then you have different types of carbon, like what you see in race cars with a checkerboard kind of um, texture to it, which was actually used on a bunch of watches a couple of years ago. Even IWC had a watch with like uh, that sort of bezel or something like that, like 10 years ago. And that sort of faded away because I guess that material is much more difficult to work with because when you have the checkerboard pattern, what happens is you have multiple layers of this actual like fiber cloth. And when you start machining that, uh, it's like it's like cutting um, the edge, you know, cutting through a weaved material, like a weaved textile. And you will have all these little threads sticking out of it. So it's not going to look right. So you have to like put it into like a metal case or something like that. You cannot have a bare carbon fiber case that's of the usual like sports car type of uh, checkerboard carbon. So that's one of the tougher things. And when you have carbon fiber reinforced polymer, that's this grainy, dark gray thing it clearly looks like something that was maybe molded or something like that. And then maybe it's either fully molded or maybe they go over it with some CNC machine to get sharper edges or something like that. So there are many different layers to this and every single layer that you add in terms of complexity and hardness in material will of course uh, increase the price considerably. I think that, I think the important point is that there's a lot of companies out there that use the word carbon yeah. in describing a case material or some type of material on the watch and that could mean a bazillion things yeah like carbon fiber is a little bit more specific carbon fiber is actually less used now Car carbon fiber the challenge with carbon fiber is to cut it in a way which is attractive so it's not just using these materials but it's it's using them in a way where it continues to look attractive and that's the ch the, the tough part so there's all kinds of materials that will look great on watches but they need to look good. Mm -hmm. If they don't look good, they're not going to be used. Yeah. Well, AP did get away with it for a while with the forced carbon. <laughs> but it was novel. It was novel, mm -hmm. and there wasn't really anything else out there that people could compare it to. That's fair. And look, this is a show-off industry. Mm -hmm. There is a value to having something where you look at it, and you're like, oh, I haven't seen that before. I want it because not a lot of other people have it. Yeah. And that's the type of thing that I think is important to consider. If you're interested in a material, are you interested because it's good? Or you're just like, oh, that doesn't look like everyone else's thing. Mm -hmm. and, and there's value in that. I mean, this is we're, we're not just talking about tools for the wrist. We're talking about fashion. Yeah. And it's okay to sit there and say, oh, I want something a little bit different because not a lot of other people have it. There's no shame in that. But you just have to know what it is that you are, are actually asking for in, you know, in, in this material. Now, the point of this conversation is to talk about which ones are interesting. We like ceramic. I'm a big fan of ceramic. A lot of it, some of it looks like crap. Mm -hmm. I remember there's some like overly rounded cases that are just Ugh. like matte finished, you know, boring. I, the first of the I, some of the IWC uh, pilot watches had those, uh, the ceramic ones, and the way they sort of got around it not looking interesting was saying like, oh, this is a tool watch. This is a military style watch, and yeah, matte black ceramic can work for that. But imagine if the Omega Dark Side of the Moon in ceramic, the Speedmaster, was just like that that sort of satinized. Yeah. It would be boring. You'd be like, okay, whatever. The whole point was it was finished like metal. Mm -hmm. So when you have ceramic that is polished like metal, it's great. Sapphire Crystal, very expensive, difficult to, difficult to find, of course, right now. Exciting, promising. If you can afford it, get it. I think that it's cool. Don't drop it, you know, just to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> Carbon. Um, it depends. Make sure you make, make yeah, it depends. I mean, I, I, it's lightweight, it's durable. It's shock absorbent. It's a very practical material for a watch. If you want a luxury look and you're going to spend a lot of money, then yeah, I think it's important that you have something that is a little bit more high-end looking. And carbon can definitely not look high-end looking. Mm -hmm. It definitely can have that look. 
Um, what are what are we missing in terms of materials, non-metal materials, um, for watches at least? Well, at least high-end things. We, we, we talked about this before, and it, it is in a way metal. But I, I do want to add, and I do want to highlight my lasting amazement uh, by the uh, by uh, Ublo's Magic Gold. I know we're talking about a lot about Ublo, but you know they deserve it. Uh, you know credit where it's due. Where you know uh, they are doing a lot of great stuff with materials. So this magic gold is uh, they uh, is created by them in house actually. I, I've been to the foundry where they make it, and it's twenty four karat gold molded with um, or alloyed with uh, boron carbide, which is the second or the third hardest material in the world, uh, and that is also sometimes used in some sort of ceramics. So they create this alloy of you know uh, Ulo likes this likes to call it fusion, but it's actually not fusion. It's an alloy between boron carbide and and, uh, and gold. And what they end up with is 18 karat gold, so it's certified, so three quarters of the material is gold. And the other quarter is not the usual things that they uh, add to gold to make it a little bit harder, but it's actual, actually this boron carbide. And that meant that basically this watch ended up not looking like gold, and that was one of the things that I actually liked about it. It was this more matte bronze kind of color to it. But I couldn't scratch it with a key, and I couldn't like I, I was wearing it for a couple of days, actually a couple of weeks, and I couldn't put any wear on it anywhere. And that for me was was super impressive that you had something that was certified as eating and gold. If you care about that, I personally don't, but I, it's still fun to think about it. And it it was just it just simply wouldn't scratch at all anywhere. I think that's that's really cool. It's it's quasi metal, I I guess you know I have to give it that, but I was still very impressed. Do you think that Hublot uses the term magic too often? Yeah. In the same way how Washaron uses iconic and Jaja uses maison. <laughs> you know, some of these brands have these buzzwords and I guess someone gets erased if they use it often enough in their press releases. It's kind of kind of amusing, right? Like yeah. how often they say that. It's hilarious. Um I think my issue with magic gold was I was wanting it to look a little bit more like gold. It's a cool material, but it looks a little bit more like bronze. Mm-hmm. A little like little if thing, you yeah. if you really like bronze but also hate bronze, get magic gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and want to spend more <laughs> than bronze. <laughs> yeah, if you like the look of bronze but nothing else, yeah. get magic gold. <laughs> that that color, a... that kind of <laughs> yellowish metal, little hint of green, like mm. it's it's like always on the edge of oxidizing, you know. It get is. with magic gold, and yet it it'll never always will. look that way. It'll yes. always look that way. It, you will forever love it or hate it. That's the beauty of it. Um, what case materials do we want to see? Like, what are people not using for case materials that we think would be a good idea? I will name not a material, but a, but something else. The property colors. I want colorful watches. I'm done with shiny, metallic looking watches or dull black, all black watches. Uh, what I I would actually I would be just chuffed to bits. I would be so happy to wear a watch that's like bright yellow or even pink or red or green or something like that or camo or something crazy. I, I, I want to have like a watch that I look at and I'm like, okay, well, that's fun. You know, I'm, I don't want to live my life, you know, all my life wearing a yellow watch, but for a couple of years or maybe like a summer or something like that, if, if it's not crazy price and you can sell it at a reasonable price, then, you know, why not? That's what I want. And you? I actually agree with you, but my worry is price. Mm -hmm. I remember several years ago, I was at Basel World and Corum presented this collection of versions of the Admiral's Cup chronograph in colorful rubber-coated cases. It was a steel watch coated in rubber in order to achieve the, 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 the color. Ooh, and you I had, see. Yes. Yellow. Was a red like one, yellow, yellow oh, green. There might have been blue. And these were great looking. And again, what they were able to, to do in order to get those bright colors was coat metal in, in rubber. But they were like seven or eight thousand bucks each, and I think the problem was that there's this need for these brands to charge a lot of money. But when when you and I or most people that we know buy a watch that's a high ticket price, we want to make sure that it it's something we can wear a long time. is very versatile. We see it sort of as a a big investment in our collection. If seven or eight thousand dollars for you is a drop in the bucket, and you're willing to spend that on something when you just feel like wearing yellow more power to you that's great but i think there was a big problem because there was definitely a fashion element that excited me 
Mm-hmm. But I was like, there's no way I'm going to sit there and think to myself, oh, my God, I love yellow so much. Maybe if, like, yellow was, like, my trademark color and I'd be like, I have to wear this all the time. But there was this mismatch, right? So I agree with you 100%. More color, more color, more color in in a, an otherwise legible watch. But at what price? I like, just found... it in vulcanized rubber, mm-hmm. you know, it, th- that's not – that can get dirty. Yeah. That can tear – it can tear, it can scratch off. Um, ceramic can't be done in those materials. I, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna get there eventually. So, so what you're saying is there isn't a specific material you're interested in, but you want to have more permanent colors, which is what I want. Yeah, exactly. I just want more fun out of this industry, and that's what I brought in my uh, in my Orlinski review. You know, with the oldest Angler Classic Fusion Hublot that looks like nothing like it. You know, and I said. Here's the thing, these brands uh, that do really well these days, like Ubel and Tacquery and a few others, realize that they have to go out of their way to create something new and exciting every single year because they cater to people who can afford to throw like 20 or 30 or 40k at a watch and, you know, every year or every two years. And these people have, you know, because usually the comments say, oh, why didn't you buy a Nautilus or a, a, a you know, Royal Oak or something like that. Most people in the world who are luxury watch buyers have already bought those watches ages ago. And the problem is that these brands like Patek, for example, with the Nautilus, if they want to increase their revenue, they cannot simply put out more iterations because that would upset the market, that would upset collectors, that would upset the brand image. It's not part of their image because they didn't go there when they had a chance. So now if they want to make more money, they have to hike their prices by 20 to 25% year over year. They don't do it all the time, but they just did it, you know, recently. So what some other brands are doing and they're doing well and they're doing the right thing, at least in my opinion, is going, you know, for bolder and bolder design. And although I'm not allowed to give any specifics, but I can say that uh, when I was at Ubley at the manufacturer last summer, I saw some crazy stuff that they're going to use for, for, uh, for cases. Absolutely crazy. Like, you haven't seen it anywhere else. And when that happens, you know, they, they clearly are in search of these solutions because they understand they have to one-up their game all the time. And if you scale it down a little bit, that's what AP is doing with all these crazy colors like orange and neon green and all this stuff. That's how they are trying to attract buyers uh, into buying a new Royal Oak every two years. Because after a while, you know, you have to create something new. You cannot just simply leave off of the 39 millimeter or whatever. So I think in closing, just, you know, to, uh, to end this monologue, I think things are going to get crazier and crazier in terms of design and color and materials. You, I think you want it to be, and I think the materials yeah. are there. Mm-hmm. We know that the watch industry from a technical standpoint is sitting on a lot of, yeah. I'll just call it intelligence. There's a lot of materials, designs, all kinds of cool stuff that could be put into production. The problem is, is that very rarely do the volumes support it. So let's say there's this exciting new movement technology. Yeah, they could implement it, but just designing the movement would cost like over a million dollars. And so you spend a bunch of money developing a movement for like what, 50 watches? So there's this there's this issue right now where the cost to to industrialize certain things that would be exciting is so high that the only way of getting started is by having a certain demographic of luxury buyer who's willing to spend it because there isn't the volumes right there isn't like oh yeah we're going to we're going to sell 100,000 of these $5,000 watches no that doesn't happen these days consumers are understandably very conservative and they're like i want to make sure that this has some demand that's why rolex does so well cuz it has demand you can buy a, a watch and you can be like oh but other people are buying it and selling it at a regular basis i feel comfortable something new comes out there's no demand there's no demand you have no idea how anyone else will want it will want it and then these days where people are very very conservative from any type of economic standpoint buying a product even if it's not a strict investment you think to yourself this is a large you know a, amount of cash mm-hmm. if i had to liquidate i don't want i don't want to be killed and you can be killed by trying to liquidate a "Quote unquote wristwatch asset," so that's why people are so focused on these values that they feel are a little bit more consistent or sustainable, like a Rolex. But but the the problem is is that what ends up happening is that everyone has was wearing the same stuff mm-hmm. or similar stuff, right? And these types of experimental, exciting things that you and I love to see tend to get less attention unless they somehow 
maintained through early adopters for five or six years, and then everyone else is like, okay, it's here to stay. We like it now. Yeah, exactly. So I think that at lower price points, you know, even if it's even, uh, ideally a few hundred bucks, but a few thousand bucks, start showing that there's value in these exciting colors and materials. Because it used to be that they ran in the watch industry or in the luxury industry. They used to test something new at a very high end level, mm -hmm. and then the less expensive um, brands would would copy it. That's the way it worked. You know, like like the the haute design fashion house would come out with a new look. Buying the authentic one was very expensive, but elements of it would trickle down to the fashion market or the ma mainstream fashion market. Right. Maybe in the watch industry, in order to make these brands feel comfortable, it should be the other way around. Make high-end versions of things that are popular, like if yellow is very popular, for example, in you know mainstream fashion, make a high-end version of it feeling comfortable that it's already popular in mainstream. You may I remember Michael Kors was very popular for its women's watches. It used these plastic cases that had like all different types of colors. It was like just different, they, they had different types of textures and different types of patterns and things like that in the colors um, of these cases. And this was very popular, a few hundred bucks. I think that there's an opportunity there maybe for the high-end brands to look below at what's, what's exciting and then maybe make a high-end version of it, which is the opposite. It, it could not work, but it's something for them to try because right now they're just sitting on their hands. Nobody wants to try anything creatively. They're just looking around and be like, who wants to take the first risk? Yeah, exactly. I think that's an expert. That's a very good look at you know, things, and a really good idea that they should maybe look below a little bit. Sometimes when they do, they fail, and this is a very like extremely risk-averse industry, and I'm not saying anything new there. I, I understand, but... Still, you know, like the craziest thing that they would do is like a new color. Like, oh my God, we just made it in green. Isn't it green enough for you? And then you're like, well, it's not black or not silver. But, you know, just because it's green, it's not going to like, you know, turn things around. And sometimes as the furthest these brands go, and if they want to like get really creative, then they will put out a halo piece with like freaking diamond like studs and like ice icicles and stuff like that in it, like AB did with the latest... Uh, real concept the first one they did for ladies in you know 18 years or i don't know how long the concept has been out like 15 years at least so finally they get around to making a women's watch version of it and it has these diamond icicles and stuff like that and it looks amazing but then they will make oh, i don't know how many 25 or 75 or something like that and it costs a gazillion and that has no effect whatsoever on their regular collection which is full of hopeless millineries and uh and rejurgative uh, royal oaks in new colors. So if these big brands don't, can't really do anything new, then, you know, what are we going to talk about next year? Go ahead, sir. We'll talk about vintage watches. Yeah. Just like everyone else. No. Let's talk of the past. Now, I, I, look, I mean, the funny thing about vintage watches is they can be cool and all, but the appeal is because that's when watch brands were trying new stuff. Yes. They could sell in mass, so they weren't worried about trying new stuff. Um, but what I keep saying with vintage watches are, for the most part, not made nearly as well as today's stuff because they have new materials today. And I think that if there's anything to, to say about selling a new watch versus an old one is new watches have better materials. Yes. For the most part. Um, and that's one of the reasons we had this entire discussion. Talk about materials. There's a life after metal. And if you have not ventured out and you're someone who still has primarily metal watches, maybe there's a, a G-Shock out there. Um, Go, you know, go out and, and, and explore a little bit. But if you just want to stick with G-Shock as your alternative to metal, even though you can get metal G-Shocks now, by all means. Um, but I, I think there's a, there's, there's a new life for watches in, in non-metals, and it's something that you and I are excited about. And I think the, the durability and scratch resistance of some of these materials and them looking newer longer is probably the biggest value proposition for this sort of mainstream uh, watch consumer. If you're interested in your watch looking newer longer, going for a non-metallic -meta material can certainly be a way to go. And that's all I have to say about that. I think that's a nice way of wrapping this conversation up. All I would add to that is I think personally, of course, you can you know send me an angry email or a comment if you, if you disagree. But I think if you go for a watch that has a non-metallic case, there's a really high chance you will actually end up loving it a lot. 
I think if you go and you say, okay, screw this, I, you know, I'm buying my fourth or fifth watch in 10 years or however much, and I'm looking for a new daily wear, and I have, you know, X hundred or Y thousand dollars to spend on it, and you spend that on something with a quirkier, newer case, I think there's a really high chance that you will actually love that decision. You will, you will be really happy with your decision. It will longer run even. David says fall in love with your watch. Yes. Okay, everyone. That's what keeps us going. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.